Hello everyone and welcome to our ISR panel discussion. Um, before we uh, begin the panel discussion, we uh, would just like to take the opportunity to address some questions which were um, uh, posed to our keynote speaker, Leon Faulkner of EnviroCopper this morning. During a, a uh, due to a technical difficulty, um, the questions were unable to be seen and he has answered them uh, via the chat box, but we'd like to give Leon the opportunity to provide uh, verbal answers. So Leon, I'll hand over to you um, to please address those questions. Yes, thanks, Alison. No worries. Uh, first one was from Sergey uh, Ivanov. How is LICS confinement going to be attained? We're quite lucky at uh, Kapunda in that there's a substantial difference in porosity and permeability between the sediments that the mine is hosted in, which are relatively porous um, and fractured, and the surrounding rocks around the outside are, are quite impermeable quartzites and bits and pieces. So we have a, a relatively good natural barrier between uh, where we want to, to do the ISR production uh, and the receptors around the place, the main one of which is the Light River. So uh, we lucked out on that one. Second question was from one of our panelists, Tom. Do you think the technical or non-technical issues are going to be bigger challenges? Now we're <laughs> at the stage where we've solved a lot of the technical challenges and we're getting into the non-technical side, particularly the land access. Um, because we're, we're, we're working quite close to a town, there is a number of government acts uh, that come into play that you don't see when you're mining out in the boondocks. And the, the interplay between local government acts, work health and safety, development acts and bits and pieces that uh, you, you wouldn't deal with in a, in a, a remote mine are certainly giving us some headaches. So I'm, I'm starting to think perhaps that the, the non-technical challenges might end up being um, uh, a little bit more complex than the, uh, than the technical ones. Uh, last question was from Jared Townsend. Um, were wireline measurements other than optical taken? Yep, in our drill holes, we uh, undertook 12 uh, different types of logging, including natural gamma, um, SP, focus resistivity, uh, magnetic declination, the hole was calipered, uh, temperature and conductivity, neutron porosity, dense wave sonic, magnetic susceptibility, spectral gamma, and uh, IP. So we ran as, as many suites as we could get done in, in the time. So that's, uh, that's all the questions. So uh, over to Lara, I think. Thank you very much, Leon. Appreciate you answering those questions. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our panel chair. Dr. Laura Kuar is a research team leader at CSIRO Mineral Resources. She's a chemical engineer and hydrometallurgist with over 19 years research experience in the minerals processing industry and across various commodity areas. Her main focus is on in situ recovery, which involves the extraction of metal from deposits without mining and communition. Her area of expertise in the ISR field is on leaching, but her leading of numerous ISR industry and government sponsored projects has led to her developing excellent knowledge across the ISR process, including mining engineering, geology, mineralogy, hydrometallurgy, chemistry, hydrology, environmental science, and social science. Lara, I'd like to hand over to you to conduct the panel discussion. Thanks very much, Alison, and I'd like to welcome everyone today to this panel discussion. Um, it's quite exciting for us. This is the third time that ALTA has run the ISR conferences, and we can definitely see a growth in attendance and interest um, in the conference itself. So I'd like to introduce our panelists to you today, and I'll start off with a very familiar face, Alan Taylor. Everyone probably knows Alan the Conference Chair, Metallurgical Consultant and Managing Director of Alta Metallurgical Services. Alan has over 40 years experience in the metallurgical, mineral and chemical processing industries. And I noticed Alan, that's in all continents bar Antarctica. So maybe that um, could be your next venture into Antarctica if there's something available. <laughs> uh, Alan's also worked across multiple commodities and since 1985, he's acted as an independent metallurgical consultant to various clients, major and junior mining, exploration and engineering companies in Australia and overseas. Alan, of course, as you might know, presents short courses and convenes conferences of which the ALTA conference is one of the highlights. Next on the panel is Frank Roberto. 
Frank is the Senior Manager of Process Innovation of Newmont Corporation. And Frank joined Newmont in 2012 and held senior and chief metallurgist positions in the Newmont Metallurgical Services Lab before he moved to his current role. Frank is also the corporate SME for biohydrometallurgy and has an interest and a passion, I think, for bacteria. He holds a Bachelor of Science and Doctorate in Biochemistry from the University of California. He's also a registered member of the Society for Mining, Metallurgy and Exploration and a specialist microbiologist in biological safety through the National Registry of Certified Microbiologists. And in 2020, Frank was elected into the US National Academy of Engineering. You've heard Leon chat this talk this morning, possibly in the keynote address and answer a few questions now. Leon Faulkner is the Managing Director of Enviro, Enviro Copper Limited. Leon is a geologist and he has over 30 years of experience in the mineral industry. And he's covered exploration to mine processing, including greenfields and grassroots, um, exploration, modeling, mine economics, mine development and new project uh, generation and acquisitions. He spent some time at the um, uh, five years at the ISR mining operation at Honeymoon in South Australia for Uranium One. And whilst he was at Honeymoon, his role of geology manager included resource development, development of wealth operational strategies for an ISR uranium mining operation, resource evaluations, analysis modeling and design, um, reports, JOC reports, ASX documentation, corporate reports, and liaising with uh, regulatory authorities, traditional owners, land, landholders, and JV partners. In 2015, Leon spent time recognizing the opportunities that ISR presents for other metals and identified a number of future potential ISR projects. And in 2017, Leon and his team established environmental copper recovery with one of the, with the main project focus at the moment being the Kapanda Copper ISR project. And then finally, we have Tom Meesham from CSRO Land and Water. Tom is a principal research scientist in resources and communities, and he has extensive experience leading interdisciplinary research teams that are focused on regional transition. Tom has a background in human geography and social science and the social dimensions of extractive industries and over 20 years experience spanning communities and experience in regional Australia. So I'd like to welcome all our panelists. It's great to have you all here. So the title of the panel today is Application of ISR to Copper. And we'll focus on strategies to unlock the potential of ISR for copper recovery, which we believe is shaping up to be the next phase in the commercialization of this rapidly developing technology. You'll all be aware that uranium ISR has been around for more than 50 years and that approximately half of global uranium uh, production is generated from ISR. And I think because of predominantly technical factors, there's been a slower uptake of ISR for other commodities but of these other commodities, there is great potential application for copper ISR. We're seeing increasingly globally the interest and uptake of the technology, um, especially in Arizona, in the US. And Leon and um, Alan both mentioned today these, these um, projects in their presentations. And I'll just touch on them again to highlight the advances in terms of copper ISR. So the first one is the most advanced in, in that region, which is the Florence Copper Project. And Florence Copper is running a production test facility. They've got four injection, nine recovery, and 15 monitoring wells. And their well-filled operation commenced in January last year with copper cathode produced in April, 2019. And the second project I wanted to mention is the Excelsior Gannison Project, which started mining operations in January this year. Um, they've been undertaking a well-filled optimization program, focusing on issues such as blockages via copper precipitation, and they were also impacted by COVID-19. But their SXEW production facility has now been commissioned, and they expect copper cathode production within 30 days. So good advances for copper ISR, especially in Arizona. What I'd like to do is just um, remind those who have dialed in that there is the opportunity to provide questions. Um, in the chat box, so please do that at any time and I'll pass on those questions to the panelists. But just to get the ball rolling, um, in terms of the very exciting times ahead for copper ISR globally, 
Leon, I wanted to kick off with a question based on your experience with the Kapanda project in, in South Australia. And no pressure, can you gaze into your crystal ball uh, and give us your thoughts? How far do you think we are behind the US in Australia? Um, and when and how do you think Australia will follow suit in terms of our uptake of ISR? Look, from a, a technical point of view, I think we're, we're at least parallel with, with the US um, as far as um, the, the research that you and your teams are doing uh, and that sort of stuff. So technically there, there wouldn't be uh, an issue for um, Australia having several ISR operations. I think where uh, we're behind at the moment is the, the regula regulatory and the, the, the permitting side of things. Uh, and that's what we've been working uh, hard on the last 18 months, two years, is, is establishing those regulatory frameworks to allow um, ISR operations to, to kick off. Um, in, a, in an ideal world, I'd like to think that if, um, if our research finishes up successfully, that we could possibly be in production in a year or two. Uh, and I think once our, um, our little project at Kapunda is, is kicked off, I think that's when you'll see a bit of a, a real surge in, in ISR interest in, in Australia. Um, if you look uh, in the, the presentation I uh, had this morning, there's uh, lots and lots of, um, uh, of ore sitting in the ground around Australia that might be amenable for ISR. Uh, and it's one of those techniques that is, is open for junior miners having a, a relatively you know, small capex to start off with. So I would suggest looking into the crystal ball, probably three to five years, you'll see probably multiple um, ISR operations in, in Australia, and hopefully at least two in South Australia. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, could I just ask, yes. uh, I, I ask uh, Leon, just to follow up. Uh, Leon, um, could you just talk about looking at your deposit there and the two deposits in, in Arizona are quite similar in terms of, uh, you know, they, they you can percolate them and so on and the type of mineralogy. What's it, what are the main differences between what you, what you have here compared with what they're, uh, what they're uh, developing over in the US? The type of deposit and the different challenges you might, you might have to face. Yeah, I guess um, we have one advantage in, at Kapunda in that it's, it's relatively shallow. So the, the ore body sort of kicks off at about 20 metres and, and um, bottoms out at about 120 metres, whereas the, the ones in the States are considerably deeper than that. So I guess that's a, uh, an advantage. We don't need wells that are, that are so deep. We probably have in the Kapunda deposit um, slightly different um, copper species. We have some more secondary copper sulfides uh, in the Kapunda deposit. We still have some, some uh, azurite and malachite up the top, but probably a little bit more um, uh, copper sulfides. And I guess uh, our uh, rocks over here are, may not be as permeable as some of the ones in the States, certainly the Kapunda siltstones, um, won't be as permeable as perhaps some of the, the rocks around Excelsior. So there's, there's those sorts of subtle differences. Uh, I think uh, overall though, the, the general approach to, to ISR, the wells, the screening and the mining technique will be, will be quite similar. Mm. That's that. And you, you mentioned sulfides, are you planning to leach the sulfides as well, in which case you're into, uh, uh, you're into ferric leaching, you're into to, uh, biological uh, activity in that. Are you handling that initially or are you focusing on oxides initially? Yeah, we'll, we'll focus on, <laughs> on the easy ones first. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we've got quite good recovery from uh, the copper oxides and, and that sort of thing. So they'll definitely be the first target, but um, uh, being a geologist, you hate to see any ore left in the ground. So we'd like to, um, uh, as the project progresses, we'd like to see what advances happen uh, in that front to, uh, to go after um, other copper species. Frank, maybe that's a, a good segue into your area of expertise in terms of the microbiology and the potential treatment of, of copper sulfides using bacteria. Do you see that as a feasible option for ISR, for copper sulfide ISR? 
It, it's definitely more challenging the deeper you go. And of course, since we're talking about living things, you know, access to oxygen, for example, is really critical for most of the iron and sulfur oxidizing microbial species we know about. Um, other gases, nitrogen, is essential carbon dioxide, since they're largely fixing CO2 for cellular components. So gas exchange will be critical, and that may be something that's an advantage for the Kapunda project. Um, the other thing we've seen is in, in our own mines where we have uh, copper heap leach that's primarily oxide, is if there's some sulfide, we tend to propagate the right microbial species to attack the secondary copper sulfides like covalite and, and calcocyte. So um, they, you know, the Kapunda project may look out in promoting the right conditions to, to get some kind of biological activity stimulated and, and recover some of that copper. Frank, just a question of reoxidizing. Uh, how are you we doing that on the surface versus how, how are you going to control that? Uh, in a heap, we know how you do that in a heap. <clears throat> you, you, you can get the heap going and, and uh, with putting air up through it. And how would you uh, envisage the, the kind of way you're going to do that in an underground mine? You're going to do on the surface or what have you got in mind, Sam? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really going to depend on the deposit. You know, if it's a consolidated... Um, porphyry deposit, for example, then you're unlikely to be able to do anything without rubbleizing or, or creating access. And, and that's where the Biomore project in Europe actually looked at mm -hmm. generating the, the, the lixivium biologically, but doing all of that microbial propagation of a, a ferric acidic solution in bioreactors and then pumping that into the subsurface. So it, it's really going to depend on how much you're willing to manipulate the, the ore body itself, I think. And the deeper you go, the harder it gets. Yeah. <laughs> and they're going pretty deep in Europe, I understand, yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, I think that's a good point that, that Leon made is that, you know, in the U.S., ISR seems to target the, the deposits where we've already used open pit mining to get you know, the really high value ore, and now we're going after either, you know, uh, landlocked or isolated deposits that we can't get right now because they're too deep. So um, he's fortunate to have a good project where it's not very deep, and you can probably recover from some things that a, a deep deposit would be very difficult to do. I actually had a similar question to Alan in terms of the decoupling. Would you aim to decouple the bacteria subsurface um, and potentially have a bioreactor at the surface? And one of the questions and the reasons I was thinking about was in terms of biofouling. Uh, what do you think the potential is for bacteria to create, to block permeability um, and prevent flow if bacteria are located underground? I think it's a big problem if you have organics. And it's not the microbes that are actually involved in the leaching that are doing the fouling, but it's organisms that, e that can either utilize the carbon that's sloughed off from the decaying microbial populations of uh, the primary iron and sulfur oxidizers, or what we've really seen as a bigger problem is if you're using lubricants and you're not controlling that organic carbon and its access to the subsurface, it's very easy to find wells that are plugged by fungal microorganisms. And so I think that's something that people have to be very conscious of is the um, hygiene of their well fields and how they control other solutions besides the ones they're using as lixivians. And Frank, is there a way of predicting ahead of time whether there might be these sorts of problems that you could run into? Yeah, the fouling sorts of problems? But uh, yeah, fouling or fungal or suggestions yeah, the, yeah. well -filled, um, maintenance. Yeah, the fungal ones I think are very easy to, they're very easy to create. Um, and I suspect that in the course of actually doing some of the test wells that are used to kind of, you know, prior to, production that 
they might see those indications of some potential for fouling, you know, just in, in the course of drilling and you know, the campaign to develop their fields. Okay. Alan, I was um, going back to the question about, you know, how long would ISR, how long would it take to, to make, a, to, for ISR to become a more mainstream process? Um, and I was interested in your, uh, you know, you mentioned things that have happened in the 80s. There was a lot of creativity and inventiveness, I think, in terms of extracting uh, value from residual um, areas in deposits. That, it seems to have slowed down. There's a resurgence and an interest. What do you think has caused that, the sort of the decline and then the, um, that increase? And do you think that we'll be able to be as, I guess, creative and expressive as some people have been in the past? Or do you think, um, how, how do you think permit, permitting might impact um, the actual application? Is that for me or for who? Who's that? Yeah, Alan, for, for yourself or anyone else. Okay. I was just going to say that, that creativity usually follows um, copper price <laughs> and, uh, and uh, or uranium price. Uh, and uh, you, with mining companies, you know, to find a deposit, you can go a long time, a lot of money uh, before you find a deposit. So when you, when you, when you find a, a, you generally go with something which is, which is established. And so it, I think that understandably mining companies are, uh, and are slow to adapt, uh, to adopt uh, new technology. They have to have an incentive. And uh, so when, when the low prices are low, uh, you find that they're just focusing on just surviving, making money and keeping going. But when the prices come up, they generally become more, more let's say adventurous. And also perhaps when they move into new zones, which are more difficult. So, so there has to be some sort of incentive and this seems to go in cycles. And I think that um, uh, the same thing in, in uranium, there has to be incentive and uh, it tends to follow that way. And when, when the prices are low, you usually find all the um, innovation sort of just plateaus and there's no money available for, re for research. And I think one of the things maybe Frank could uh, comment on that and, you know, looking back, uh, uh, you know, decades ago, all the big mining companies had in-house in research organizations. And uh, when, the, when the prices, uh, copper price dropped, a lot of them closed down and you just don't see much of it these days. And so the uh, innovation is left to, um, to uh, places like CSIRO or others who, who need money. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. I, I think it's, it's harder today because of the, I think it went in the old days when the big companies had their in-house uh, uh, development organizations, I think a lot, they could do a lot. And uh, nowadays it's not so easy to do that. I know if maybe Frank might comment on that, being part of a big company. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you touched on some really important things there, Alan, that, you know, the price of the metal that you're, you're mining has a lot to do with what you're willing to do to go after it. So when you're flush with cash and prices are high, there's, there's certainly a more adventurous or innovative spirit, but miners are conservative by nature. And so once that price plummets, then there are you know, dramatic contractions. Um, where the United States, I think, really suffered you know, kind of a, a double whammy, if you will, for ISR in Arizona in particular was both a drop in copper price and the demise of the U.S. Bureau of Mines. So yeah. there is no governmental research organization that supports yeah. hard rock mining in the U.S. now. I think Unlike that was Australia, a very sad day. Had... I think it was a very sad day when when the U.S. Bureau of Mines, because I thought they were a, a fantastic organization, and they generated so much. I mean, really, you look back in the U.S. Really, they were behind the revival in, in gold with the carbon and pulp that it was being developed in South Africa as well. Mm -hmm. but, uh, they really generated the whole thing. And uh, not having that anymore, I think was a, a major national mistake in my opinion. And I'd just be very thankful we still have the CSRO here in Australia. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, it's you know, even impacted academic research as well. So yeah. you, know, you see a real dearth of opportunities, both for people to develop technology and for mining companies to access it domestically within the U.S., so you're, you're very fortunate in Australia to 
to have you know both the governmental and the, the industrial support to, to push technology. Mm. I don't know, I think it's quite interesting that you know the comments on what are the drivers for us to implement um, new technology and one is constraints um, and I, I think we'll see in future we've uh, had discussions with many companies who are talking about minimizing waste energy usage and ISA certainly um, presents a potential opportunity to avoid tailings has become a, a major issue for many and kind of environmental and social issues of environmental yeah. mining, which is becoming quite unpopular, especially yeah. near townships. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, a, a, a perfect intro to Tom. There's actually a question in the chat from Robbie McDonald. So Tom, maybe you can answer this and we could, then afterwards we could maybe speak a bit more broadly about um, earning the social license to operate. Robbie asks, hi Tom, is there any intent to revisit the social aspects of the Kapanda project as the community becomes better informed about the project? If so, do you expect to get a better outcome from such a survey? Thanks, Laura. And also thanks, Robbie, for the question. It's a really, really great question. I think uh, definitely it's very important to think about things as they change over time. So in social research, we, we do like to do longitudinal studies when we can. Uh, coming back to those comments about research and funding and support, it's actually the hardest research to get funded, getting that kind of ongoing um, mm -hmm. support to do research. It's actually the hardest one to get. But where we have been able to do that on social license for other sectors, uh, particularly, for example, in the oil and gas sector, we do see changes over time in acceptance levels as both uh, related to the to the kind of stage of development, like if you know you move from operations to more well, construction operations or whatever, but also just as people's experience of what it's like to live in and around a development um, unfolds. You know, they see what the actual jobs are, they see what the actual dust is like, or whatever it whatever it is. Plus, of course, there's often an exchange in people, so. You get people moving into an area, you get people moving out of an area anyway. So we do see these changes in, in social acceptance and social license. So tracking these things over time is, is really important. Um, I will come back to this point, which is in the second half of the question, do we expect to see better outcomes from the survey? I should point out that the outcomes from this piece of research were actually pretty high. So in the, I, I was naturally quite cautious in interpreting the results because we've got to be cautious. But to set the bar, the public is skeptical, uh, certainly in Australia, uh, we've measured it. The trust in government, trust in companies, trust in many things is actually very low. So the results that we see for this development in Kapunda are actually quite favorable, so this proposal in, in Kapanda. And what we're really just seeing is the sorts of concerns that people would have anyway. You know, I don't, I don't think you get a kind of a higher level of acceptance at this point in time for a future perspective project, but people still have concerns and still have like their issues and whatever. So would they go up uh, in terms of the, you know, level of support? Possibly, there's still room for pe more people to be more accepting, but even if they were just maintained, I would say that means that um, it's pretty positive. Um, so in terms of the question, is there a plan to go back, remeasure? Not at the moment. Uh, there's no kind of current plan to do that. I think it would be a good thing to do, um, particularly if there's a material change in the nature of the project. So let's just say there was a kind of a permitting application or something like that. It might make more sense to go back uh, when there's been some kind of change. Um, but uh, yeah, what, what we can say is that the levels of, of acceptance are already quite high. The sort of uh, concerns which are there, they're pretty much standard sort of concerns that the public has. Um, and um, yeah, I think it would be good to go back over time if there's a possibility to do that. Tom, it's, um, I always think back to the fact that you can't model the stock exchange because there's the human emotion involved. Um, and I think it would be very useful. Can you give some of um, some your impression in terms of for industry, when, when should they engage with stakeholders, uh, community, 
Um, and how much do they share? When, when did they share what? So look, it's a really good question. And the best approach is engage early and engage often. So I guess there's a cost to engagement. There's a cost in terms of doing it. It actually costs money. But there's also a cost in terms of, you know, are we kind of going to stir up risk and concern when it wasn't there? As an example, um, in the oil and gas industry, they didn't bother to do that with fracking. They just said, ah, oh, who knows what's going to happen? Maybe not. Maybe no one will be concerned. And then years later, there was a huge concern, right? So I think that kind of do nothing, ignore, don't worry about it, see what happens kind of strategy is pretty flawed. I think um, engaging early, engaging often, listening is really the best way to go. Definitely in terms of sharing information, you want to be sharing information with as much certainty as you can and being honest and, and upfront around where the limitations of that certainty are. So if you sort of say, well, this is what we know about the nature of this. These are the bits we don't know yet. Um, that's, a, that's a good way. It, it will introduce questions. People will say, well, how, can, how, how come you don't know exactly how much copper will be produced? Or how come you don't know exactly when it's going to happen? Because we often live in, in, a, in a world where we imagine we have complete information when we actually don't. Um, but the alternative is, is if you are seen to be holding something back, that can be perilous. So those companies which sat on information a bit longer, you know, didn't release some information, and then it turned out to be a real issue, that's kind of come back to bite them pretty hard. Same as not just companies, but also, you know, government information too. So the engage early, engage often, and listen, I think is one of the big ones. One of the really interesting things from my experience working in this area is often what the industry thinks would be the issues and the concerns or whatever, they're very often different to what the public thinks they are. So the public have their own set of perceptions, interests, concerns, what matters to them. And quite often they're based on relatively limited understanding of, of certainly of the geology and, and of, the, um, of the, the mining process, but they are concerns which affect them in, in ways that are, are direct to them. So what's it going to do to the health of my children? What's it going to do to the jobs in my town? You know, uh, what's it going to do to infrastructure? What's it going to, these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, so this, this sort of information there's, there's sort of no reason to hold it back if, if you have that information. Mm. Um, I, get, I guess you, there's a, there is a question, I think, which you put your finger on there in terms of timing. So how much information to share when? Mm -hmm. I guess it's kind of, kind of, a, kind of a, an important thing. And, and in this research, what we found was there were different segments. So that we, we found kind of three segments, people who, who just wanted as much information as they could get people who kind of just wanted to be updated from time to time and people who didn't actually care much but if it was going to change they would want to know if something is going to change like let's just say the results have come in applications are going ahead that's the thing they would want to know um other people they wanted to know a lot of a lot of information and i think the sort of the one of the things we talked about not so long ago laura was um the role of demonstrations. I think Alan, you, you brought this up. And for a lot of people, there is a kind of curiosity, like how does that actually work? You pump the stuff down, like where does it go? It goes here, it goes there, whatever. This kind of thing really engages people's minds. And if there's an absence of information, they will fill it with guesswork. And we've definitely seen this in the oil and gas sector, particularly with the commissioning and all kinds of myths and ideas which were quite negative and quite destructive and could have done a lot of damage to that sector just came from people imagining what would happen when you walk away from a well, you know, just do this, do that, whatever. Um, so I guess, uh, yeah, like having the information available um, for those people who have who've expressed a keen interest to receive a lot of it, making it particularly available to them, and then just 
yeah, from time to time updating mm. other people who have more general interest. The surveys have shown recently that social acceptance and that is right at the top of concerns of mining and indus mining industry. So times have changed, I think. They have the things like tailings down failures and things like that. I think that uh, the present environment, mining companies are, bec are becoming very aware and they have a social acceptance right at the top of the list now. Mm -hmm. That's that certainly, um, you're now getting um, investment funds and bits and oh. pieces who will only invest in, in sustainable ethical mining companies and bits and pieces. So it, there's, it's starting to bite the pocket, which I think is a, is a, is a new, a relatively new phenomena. And it's going to be important for you know, groups like us, because obviously if we're viewed as being ethical and sustainable, we stand a better chance of, of getting funding. I think with what Tom was saying, uh, you know, if you don't control a narrative from the beginning, somebody else is going to control a narrative. And once somebody else gets control of it, it may be, it may be exactly what you don't want to hear. And once that gets out, it's going to be very difficult to counteract. Is that, is that true, Tom? Definitely, there will be people who will seek to control that narrative and they will use misinformation deliberately and inadvertently in a combination of all of that. Um, it is contested. There are people who take a stance, philosophical or otherwise, ethical, whatever. They have their reasons and they will seek to control the narrative and they're not necessarily bound by truth mm -hmm. and they're not necessarily bound by a lot of the governance which does apply to the minerals injury industry so you were talking before about all the reports and the jewel reports and all this kind of thing there's no there's no regulation you want to put something up we've seen it in you know social media recently all kinds of stuff gets posted there there's mm -hmm. no regulation of that so i think definitely um uh being proactive, Alan, I think is the kind of the key point you're, you're making there, I think is a really good strategy. Mm -hmm. Liam, I was interested to know, were there any revelations or surprises or interesting things that you thought came out of the focus groups, the social work that uh, Tom did? Uh, not really. I mean, we, we'd spoken to a lot of people coming into the office, so we had a fair idea of, of, of you know, um, where people's questions were going to go, obviously groundwater uh, and what was going to happen to the environment was pretty much top of the list. So that was no surprises. Um, we uh, Probably the only thing that did surprise me was that um, people uh, sort of were a bit worried that we didn't know specific things or we didn't have regimented timelines and, and things like that because you know, a lot of that is... Um, uh, we can't control it. It's, it's when we get access to the ground, we can do this, and that's got to go through councils or if we've got to get government approvals. And and that stuff is, is out of our control. So we, we can't put rigid timelines and, and things on that. So I was, I was sort of surprised that people didn't, um, didn't sort of understand that there was a lot of stuff in that side that, that companies can't control, you know. Governments will grant approvals when, when they want to grant an approval or council will give you permission when they, they want to give you permission. So those sorts of things that the companies can't really control. Mm. And, and Frank, I was interested in the US with the new ISR copper um, developments. Is there much bandwidth given to these, these, I guess, different mining approaches? Do you hear much about them more broadly in the media or in industry? What is the... What is the dissemination of information? What level is it at? I think public awareness outside of Arizona for ISR is probably minimal. Okay. And certainly in the industry is following it because these projects have been trying to move forward for quite a long time. Mm. And I think that just points out, you know, the real challenge hasn't been the, the technological ones, it's been the social ones. And in the U.S., the real question, I think, and challenge for these first projects is, can we really do what we say we're going to do in terms of containment of solutions? Because the concern really is, are you going to contaminate my groundwater? You know, as a citizen that lives around these facilities, 
you know, they, they want to know that their water will be safe to drink when all is said and done. Mm. So we can't have any screw ups really. Mm. Yeah, I think, um, you know, when we started off on the ISR journey, for me, at least from a technical background, that's what we think about mostly. Um, and it's become very apparent, you know, the social and environmental issues are, are critical. Um, and I think there's a bit of a dilemma because in terms of the potential environmental benefits of ISR, there are so many, as long as it's done properly. And um, I think that's where I always say that for us, the research is important to, to ensure that we can do that properly. Yeah. One, one point I, I'd like to raise is on, on what you were saying, and, and I noticed that um, I think on Leon's project, they are looking at different uh, lexivians and uh, along the lines of social acceptance and that is, uh, is there a big incentive to move away from, you know, acid, for example, especially if you're near a township? Is this something that are you, uh, Lauren, and ISR uh, business, uh, does the ISR business see the need to, to look at more um, benign, let's say, extractants? Mm. Leon, did you want to comment on that? Oh, look, I, I think, yeah, I can comment that, but you're probably as good as, as, as anyone there. Certainly, we, uh, when we started off, we were very interested in looking at um, glycine, the, the amino acid there, because that's seen as a very, um, uh, very benign chemical. Uh, and similarly, now we know that the, the groundwater is acidic, we're looking at um, methane sulfonic acid, the NSA, which is uh, quite readily biodegradable. So, um, Theoretically, 90% of it breaks down in 28 days, uh, and we'll do some research to find out. But I think uh, that the strategy of looking at using excipients that suit the groundwater environment is the, the, the big thing today, that if you've got um, an acid groundwater environment, you want to use an acid excipient. If you've got an alkaline groundwater environment, use alkaline. If you've got a, a neutral environment, use something that, that in there. So the, the idea of trying to drastically change the groundwater environment with the lexibian is probably one of the biggest changes I think we've been going forward. And, uh, I think it's, I it's think probably that's something you champion. Yeah, I think it's also important to note that regardless of what you put in the ground, it's it could be a change. It's a variation from the background. So even if um, you put fresh water mm -hmm. into a saline environment, um, that is a step change, a difference. And um, just speaking to colleagues in, in land and water, from the environmental perspective, it's important to be able to then restore original conditions, um, regardless of what is used in your, in your leaching. But I do agree, if we can minimize the deviation from background, um, it's obviously potentially easier to then restore to original conditions. Mm. Um, so I wanted to just um, touch a little bit on some of the enabling technologies and approaches and methodologies for copper ISR. There's, a number of, we, I, you know, the social environmental is absolutely critical, but there are also a number of um, great technical developments that have happened recently. And I know, Liam, we've mentioned this in discussion previously. I was wondering if you wanted to talk about some of the potential upcoming highlights or other enabling technologies that could advance copper ISR more rapidly. Yeah, certainly from uh, our, our point of view, because uh, a lot of the Copper ISR is going to be in fractured rock aquifers. It's not in the, the traditional layer cake sand between two, two aquifer, uh, two aquaclude clay bodies. Containing your lixivians is, is a, going to be a very, um, uh, a very important point. So being able to install barriers is going to be a, a, um, a mass aquifer deposit because they, they're much more difficult to model than, than the traditional horizontal layer cake type uh, things. So being able to install a barrier, go out and process the, um, the ore, and then have that barrier either naturally biodegrade or be able to remove it, uh, is going to mean that you can mine many different areas and also have more confidence if you're closer to a town that you're, you're not going to affect uh, groundwater supplies. So I think barrier technology is one of those enabling technologies that is really going to, um, to make a difference going forward. Uh, obviously the, the, the different lixivient systems, uh, if they can be seen as um, less impactful than the traditional sulfuric acid or whatever people are using, 
that will obviously give uh, the public confidence in, in ISR operations around the place. Um, and obviously, you know, further down the track, things like electrokinetics would obviously be a, a, a huge advance if we can um, do away with having to put fluid in the ground at all uh, and just move ions around the place that would uh, that would be the the um, the most amazing thing we'd have for for hard rock ISR. Mm. Okay. Um, another question I had was um, where we might where might be the best place to implement copper ISR and Maybe, Leon, from your perspective as a smaller mining company, Frank, your perspective as a larger mining company, Tom, your perspective in terms of community, Alan, just from your vast experience over um, many mining operations, if you all just like to have a, a go at where you think ISR copper could be most readily applied. Um, well, from, from, from our point of view, um, in, in South Australia in particular, it'll be uh, around those mainly historic deposits. Um, the old timers, you know, sort of picked the eyes out of them, took the, the 15 to 20% ore out, but left a lot of, um, you know, the, the half a percent to one to 2% ore sitting around. So there are probably at least uh, a dozen old historic copper mines in South Australia that would be pretty ready targets for this. Kapunda's obviously one, but the, the Wallaroo Moonta, region uh, on the York Peninsula, uh, Burra uh, around the Monster Mine, so Princess Royal and Burra North and in the Flinders Ranges up there. These are um, deposits that are, that are well known, the geology is known, some of them have been drilled out and have resources on them, but they're, they're just sort of either not big enough or just, just don't cut the mustard from a conventional mining sense. But for a small company, uh, and with, with relatively low capex uh, um, for ISR, they could be quite profitable and produce pretty good margins. So they would be targets for a company our size, uh, probably not of interest to, to, to Frank at Newmont, but um, yeah, we, we certainly would look at them. Frank, did you want to comment? Well, I think in the United States, really the, the focus has been on Porphyry deposits where you have a surrounding um, highly impermeable base rock, you know, granitic rock, for example. So you might have four orders of magnitude less permeability in the surrounding rock because, you know, as I mentioned before, the, the potential for contaminating groundwater really is the big concern in the U.S. Um, and it doesn't matter whether the groundwater might be naturally acidic or alkaline. Um, it comes down to what's the drinking water standard in the United States. So um, anything you do that, that deviates from that is gonna be very difficult to permit. Um, now operating in other countries may be a different story, but you know we typically are focused on development that uses US national standards first and then trying to um, implement that somewhere else. Um, but as Leon was saying for us, it's got to be a much larger deposit yeah. to really make sense for us because we don't, we don't really go after small island type deposits. Um, mm -hmm. So it would be something in the context of perhaps a brownfield operation mm -hmm. where we've already done the exploration around our existing operation. And so it's going to lead to an extended life of mine, um, but it still has to have the right characteristics for a, a well-contained ISR project. Okay, thank you. Tom. Sure. So I guess uh, it's a really good question and we don't know for sure what the answer is yet, but I think that first of all, for what we do know is that uh, same technology, same impacts will be accepted in one place and not in another place. And that's to do with the character of certain populations who interpret risk differently, or they, they have a different identity. Uh, and we've certainly seen that in Australia with uh, certain technologies being banned in some states and accepted in other states, and similar in US. Um, so I think that there will be places where there's already a kind of a degree of acceptance and familiarity 
with the mining sector in general, where mm -hmm. I think that ISR is more likely to to be welcome, to be um, seen as uh, as a as a good technology. And then I guess it comes down to the specifics of those social social license factors. You know the relative impacts versus the relative benefits, the, the, the trust in the particular company and the, tr and the confidence in the governance arrangements, which are all gonna vary locally. You know, some jurisdictions, the governance might be seen as, you know, a bit more trustworthy and others less so and whatever. And I think that that kind of combination will, will mean that it, it will be quite patchy, I think. Uh, but coming back to something that you said, Laura, which was around, the potential for this this method to be seen as part of remediation and rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe not rehabilitation, but, but definitely kind of remediation. That could change things quite significantly. I mean, I think if it's seen by the public as um, something which in, improves environmental condition, then that, mm -hmm. that will have quite a big effect. Mm -hmm. I think Frank's comments around um, uh, the the risk or the fear or the perception of uh, potential contamination of the, of the groundwater, that will be a big one here too, I think. Um, so you might find where those aquifers are, are very important to people, uh, Great Artesian Basin or you know, other, other aquifers, which can be quite large areas. Um, they will have additional, additional factors, additional um, concerns. But yeah, we'll have to wait and see, I guess. Well, I think, I think that, um, Laura, I think that, I think the, the junior companies are small deposits that you cannot uh, treat by, by conventional means uh, and, and act, you know, active, proactive junior companies. I suspect that that's where we are in copper at the moment. Mm. Uh, and I think that generally the way it goes in the mining industry, you find going right back to, <clears throat> to heat bleach, so, sorry, to solvent extraction that got started in the, in the smaller companies and became more accepted. And then it went from there. I think that, uh, I think that uh, entrepreneurial small companies that see opportunities of stranded deposits that can't be treated by other means and so I think a lot of it lies there. And I think as Tom suggested, it's going to be a question of, uh, are they welcome to do that? Uh, and does the, uh, the place they are, do they want to do it and so on? Mm -hmm. I think these are the issues. And I think it's going to be for a while probably at the smaller end, uh, because as you go bigger, then the implications are going to get bigger. Mm. Uh, and uh, I think we do need to, to gain some more knowledge and experience and gain trust in uh, the industry. And I suspect that's where it's going to be for a while. Obviously, we've gained a lot in uranium, but uranium deposits, you know, they, they tend not to be, you can, you can make money out of a smaller uranium project because the price is higher. But when you come to copper, especially bigger companies, they need big, de big deposits to make mm. money out of it. And uh, mm. so I think I think it's going to be different from commodity to commodity. Yeah. Okay. I've got a follow-up question, Alan, for yourself and Tom. And then there's a question in the chat, chat from Sergo, which I'll get to as well. Um, Alan, you spoke about the in situ and the in mine and in place leaching. Do you have a sense in terms of which of those might be uh, also best to implement first? Sorry, which of those? So the in mine or in place? Oh, in mine, Did yeah. You? yeah. Well, I, I spent quite a bit of time in the old gunpowder mine up in uh, up in the north the northeast of, uh, of Australia, up in Queensland, and they had a uh, an old mine that was was there, and they were mining high grade uh, high grade chalcosite uh, and uh, some, I guess, charcoal pyrite as well. And when it became uneconomic, then they went underground in the old areas and started to do underground heat bleaching mm -hmm. and um, uh, I think that uh, I think that went um, the other thing was they didn't have much room on the surface to do uh, uh, regular heat bleaching so doing it underground was beneficial from that point of view I, I think it's that that some advantages there because you have space to uh, uh, to work and you have you can create a, a bio system underground and that it's pretty difficult to predict uh, what 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 particle size you're going to get. It's difficult to uh, predict recovery and leach rate. You you have to really do a lot of work on a fairly big scale. But but I do believe that's that's doable. 
uh, I think it's probably easier to do it as a uh, as a satellite to an existing operation. Uh, it's harder to do it on a, a greenfield situation where you, well, uh, maybe an old mine going in an old mine and predicting what you're going to do and, and get money to uh, to do it without having making money on regu something regular next door. Uh, but I do think that uh, uh, that has a future. And doing it on a new mine, I think that leads into a, a whole new area. And that's being, I think, uh, talked about at this, at this conference. Yeah. And uh, maybe I'll leave, for, I'll leave it for those, uh, uh, for, those, for, those for those presentations. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, we could get some questions after those. Tom, um, um, just a follow-up question I had for you in terms of, you know, where could this be applied from a community perspective? What tools do we have available to assess that? Uh, is, it, is it possible to do it relatively simply and quickly? Um, well, I mean, there's an enormous amount of uh, social impact assessment tools and processes and which, which have been developed in a much more general way for any kind of development. Uh, we have also developed what you might call some profiling. So we, we were working on an atlas, actually, of perceptions and uh, views and perspectives of the public. We, we got it up to a prototype, but we, we never actually released it. Maybe, maybe we should have, um, which just kind of looked at the variation in, in attitudes and perceptions around the country on, on, a, on a range of things. Um, other than that, I think because it does get quite sort of locally specific we can't get around the, the local specific type studies you know i mean i think it does the, the the individual characteristics of certain communities are, are quite variable and their circumstances are, are a big factor so you know that's why um some developments uh, go ahead and some don't even if on a purely technical point of view you think well this one looks fine and this one looks the same, but one went ahead, one didn't. Mm. I think the issue there is there are these very local specific factors mm. um, and we, we still need to pay attention to those. Okay. Thanks, Tom. So I'll move to um, Sergey's question. This is Sergey Ivanov asks, a reclamation strategy as underground tailings with a focus on effective and permanent confinement as well as the engineered immobilization of any potential contaminants. So I think Sergei is um, suggesting that ISAR could be used as such a reclamation strategy. He asked, is it hard to achieve in low grade deposits as the ore volume is large and can it work in high grade settings? Um, so I think the question is around ore volumes, the sizes, the grades, um, reclamation. Does anyone have any thoughts in terms of ISI application as a reclamation strategy and where might it be best applied in terms of grade and, and size? And we've got just two minutes to go. Time is gone. <laughs> uh, I, I think, I, oh, sorry, Alan, do you go? I think Alan was just commenting on the time. Leon, you go no, for sorry, it. No, I was focusing on the fact that we're almost gone and we're just getting going here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good. Yeah. Up, up to uh, Ian, to, up to uh, the Ian. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I think, um, yeah. Sorry, Leon. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I think it has legs as a reclamation um, strategy. Don't know enough about it at the moment to, to have any idea what, what sort of tons and grade you, you might need to, to make it work. But, you know, when, when you look at um, ISR in general, it has a fairly low capex, capex so you imagine you could go down to fairly low grades. Uh, the volume probably wouldn't be an issue. You just have more wells and, and pump more fluid and that sort of stuff. But um, yeah, I, th I think it, it would be a, a good project to have a look and try and do some economics on it. And I think there's a, um, there's a presentation coming up this afternoon on economic modelling and application yeah. of in situ recovery in hard rock mining. So uh, yeah. there might be some answers in there. Thank you. So we are at time and I think it's um, nice to end on a bit of a conclusion where ISR always think of as very creative. There's lots of opportunities and it potentially could be applied in a, in a large number of areas. 
Um, and there's there's a lot of interest, a lot of brains and input going into all the work. So it's it's encouraging. Thank you very much to all our panelists. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hand back to Alison who will just close us out. Thank you, everyone. That was an excellent panel discussion. Um, for the audience, we will uh, hopefully get this uploaded um, hopefully tomorrow so that you can view it uh, you know, until March. We'd like to uh, thank all our panelists and to our, our panel chair, um, Dr. Lara Kuhar, and also to uh, CSIRO who have been partnering with Alta on the, in the ISR space for the thank last few that. years. So um, we say thank you very much to you all and we hope you have a great rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, thank you.